This is the To Health With That, Naturally Healthy in No Time podcast for big health topics taken in small bites. I'm your host, naturopathic doctor Amy Nuzel, and this is season one, all about the MTHFR mutation. Today, we're going to talk about methylation, detoxification, and the glamorous MTHFR lifestyle. I'm picturing sequins and feathers and beautiful women in luscious red dresses with martini glasses, with skewers of exotic fruit. Yeah, maybe it's not that glamorous, but there is an MTHFR lifestyle. We'll get into that in a minute. First, the detox part. Detoxification sounds like a thing we do after a raging party or a week-long trip to Vegas. In reality, it isn't. It's something we do constantly. We detox after we drink water, breathe air, eat food, exercise, we detox during sleep, and we detox from the entirely normal body processes that happen all day, every day. It isn't reserved for when you've added something to your body that's known to be toxic. It's as constant as death and taxes. There is, of course, a thing doing a detox, quote unquote. I don't know if you could hear the bunny ears there, but they were there. And that usually means taking a few days out of your life and really pushing your body to clean house by fasting or eating a very simple diet or supporting your liver with herbs or supplements, ramping up the fiber, or maybe doing detox activities like Epsom salts baths and saunas to sweat it out. Detoxing in this way is also dependent on methylation, but I'm talking about the far more simple everyday housekeeping that your body needs to do. So why do we need methylation to detox? Methylation is actually one of the main pathways your body uses to eliminate certain toxins. Detoxification of most substances happens in some combination of three phases. A few substances need all three, most need two, and some need only the first phase. So in phase one, it's called modification. In this phase, the original toxin is modified to make them more reactive and polar, to help them on their way to water solubility. This is so we can do more things to them, like making them water soluble, or getting them into the right state to attach something else to them so that we can actually chuck them out. Note that phase one often makes these chemicals more active, and they're usually still small enough to cross cell membranes. So if they can't move on to phase two, they hang around doing damage, sometimes even more damage, than the original substance itself might have. This phase largely happens through the cytochrome P450 pathway, which we really don't need to discuss here. Phase two is called conjugation, and this phase attaches a charged molecule, like a methyl group, for instance, in order to make the molecule less biologically active, the toxin molecule, and also to allow it to be actively transported out of the body, because we don't want it in there. There are six different types of phase two reactions. One of them is methylation. And in phase three, there's some further modification and excretion. Many toxins are gone after phase two, but a few need the additional step. So what happens in methylation? To be clear, this does not use the MTHFR enzyme directly. It uses the product of the MTHFR enzyme, which is SAMe. In methylation reactions, your body takes the mutant Mickey Mouse head methyl group off of SAMe and attaches it to a toxin so that the toxin can be eliminated. For MTHFR folks, SAMe might not be as plentiful as it should be because there's a bottleneck through the MTHFR enzyme, or at least the potential for a bottleneck. So what types of toxins need to be methylated? Well, there's many, but the ones of most concern are heavy metals. These include arsenic, mercury, selenium, which is actually necessary in small amounts but toxic with high exposure, and cadmium. That doesn't seem like a lot, so what's the problem? Well, as with every other body system, chemical pathways and enzymatic reactions have the bad habit of interconnecting, meaning the products or function of one pathway end up being necessary for the actions of another. This is how MTHFR messes up your urea pathway, which is how we detox ammonia and make your urine. It's one of the most common pathways used for detoxification, and also it messes up any pathway that needs glutathione, which is called the master antioxidant. They don't call it that for no reason. We'll get to glutathione in another week because this one has the potential to be a little bit heavy. So the urea pathway. There's a diagram in the show notes on the website, to healthwiththat.com, that shows the way some of these cycles interconnect. 
And so there's a big wheel like a gear called the methionine cycle. And that's where we get to our glutathione. And it intersects with the folate cycle. So as the folate cycle, which is MTHFR dependent, is turning, it also helps that methionine cycle to turn. The folate cycle then also gears up with something called the BH4 cycle. That's where we get into trouble with things like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. That's our neurotransmitters. And then the BH4 cycle in turn gears up with the urea cycle. So all of these cycles are dependent on each other to turn properly. If something slows down in one of those cycles, it actually affects every one of those cycles. So that's why MTHFR has so many far-reaching effects, because it really does gear into this whole pathway. So the urea pathway specifically uses end products of the BH4 pathway, which just needs methylation to work. If methylation is bottlenecked, BH4 is in short supply, and the toxic waste ammonia builds up because your body cannot convert it to urea, which is eliminated in urine. Ammonia causes neurological inflammation at very high levels, usually only seen in actual liver failure, not so much with MTHFR. Ammonia overload can lead to seizures, coma, and death. At the lower levels we see with MTHFR mutations, it just leads to a little bit of neurological inflammation. But neurological inflammation can exacerbate symptoms like fatigue or brain fog or depression. So what is this MTHFR lifestyle? It sounds like it could be so good. And honestly, for people with MTHFR mutations, it does make life a lot better. But it's not so glamorous. We'll talk about it at great length on other days. But here's some of the basics. For MTHFR folks, we tend to avoid synthetic folic acid and foods fortified with synthetic folic acid. We decrease our body's toxic burden through both toxin avoidance and also by promoting detox, the type we talked about earlier. We reduce stress. We increase mindfulness. We boost food sources of natural folate like dark leafy greens, lentils, and pulses. And we get good sleep. Yeah, that's pretty not glamorous, actually. We'll talk about this in detail, I promise. So here's an interesting aside about the idea of sweating it out. There's been a lot of debate over the usefulness of sweating during therapeutic detox. There's uh, lots of naysayers, like I'll cite an article from the New York Times, which you can see the full link to on the website and also the citation, claiming that such a tiny amount of toxin elimination is effectively meaningless. And I quote from the article, Dr. Schwartz compared it to someone sitting in a bathtub worrying about drowning. Removing a dropper full of water from the tub will theoretically reduce the risk because the chance of drowning in lower water is less. But getting rid of so little water will be effectively meaningless. Interestingly, the article also acknowledges that heavy metals and BPA from plastics are detectable in sweat. For an opposing view, a systematic review published in the Journal of Environmental Public Health compiled research studies on arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury excretion in sweat. This shows a clear documentation within the research of the ability of your body to eliminate these substances through sweat. And I quote, Arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury may be excreted in appreciable quantities through the skin. Rates of excretion were reported to match or even exceed urinary excretion in a 24-hour period. End quote. The link and citation for that article are also in today's show notes on tohealthwiththat.com. Clinically, I've seen therapeutic sweating as part of a larger protocol to be highly beneficial for many clients, helping them to improve their energy levels, reduce brain fog, decrease sensitivity reactions, and improve their overall health. But on the evidence pyramid, things we observe in clinical practice are always on the low end because there's so many uncontrolled variables. Those people might have improved because of sweating and other things we were working on, or solely because of the other things we were working on, or because of something entirely unrelated. This is why, when I'm talking about things I've observed in clinical practice, I'm very careful to specify. Also, in terms of my categories of evidence, which you can see in full on the website, I'd give the whole sweating it out concept a C. This means there's a combination of some research and clinical evidence, but not definitive proof. So today was one of the heavier topics, and I apologize, a lot of it's very visual. But we are coming to the good juicy stuff, the treatment stuff. So bear with me. Hang in next week. We'll talk about MTHFR and hormones, and then we'll start getting into what you can actually do about your MTHFR mutations. <laughs> <laughs>